You know what? I'd love to give you a, a little exercise. I do not so often anymore, but it's so relevant to your concept for your show, which is I walk in and say, think about the metaphor you use for your business. Does it come from football, basketball, soccer, or ultimate frisbee? And what would it mean from each of those? And they get to explore where does the control, the locus of control in each of them. Like in Phil Jackson's version, the locus of control is in the team on the field moving it on the court. Basketball, it's on the side calling the plays. Ultimate Frisbee, there's no one calling anything anywhere. And soccer, it's constantly moving and you have nobody calling plays. What does that do? If you're in Europe where they don't have American football, I work in companies and they, their metaphor changes how they view the world and how all the things, they don't have a behavioral model where something has to come from the outside. You might have fun with that. This is the Play Your Position podcast, where we huddle up, call the plays, and inspire you to run your ball into the end zone. Are you ready to score more game-winning touchdowns in your life, business, and career? Then listen up, because it's game time, baby. Now, here's your host, Mary Lou Kayser. Hello, hello, Team PYP. Mary Lou Kayser here. Welcome to another episode of the Play Your Position podcast, where we talk all things leadership and business, careers, showing up as your best self, and transforming your life through answering the call to leadership. Today is no exception. I've got a really, really interesting guest for us to and hear about her leadership journey. Her name is Carol Sanford, and she's coming to us from a beautiful little enclave between the Canadian border and Seattle, Washington. Carol, are you ready for kickoff? I'm so glad to be here, Marianne. Let's do it. (laughs) Let's do it indeed. So here's some things that I know about Carol. She is a best-selling author. She has written numerous books include this book, which talks a lot about how do we show up in the world as leaders when there's so much going on, it's hard for people to focus and concentrate. And one of the things that I really like about Carol's work that I've learned about is she likes to disrupt conventional thinking. She likes to ask provocative questions. And because she's not afraid to take a stand, she's been invited to work with some of the world's most amazing institutions, including Stanford and Babson College. And she speaks all over the place talking about these ideas of hers. Her books are required business school reading at Stanford and Harvard. That's how ingrained what she's written. It's just amazing to me. I'm I'm actually honored uh, to be talking to someone of her stature. And I'm going to let her share her journey with us. So Carol, would you be so kind to tell us about when you got the call to leadership, what was going on in your life? How did you know, or did you know that you were going to be a leader? Well, I have to start by being contrarian, Mary Lou. I've never (laughs) thought of me as a leader. I don't even like the concept of leader being attached to an individual because to me, it's a process that you have to activate in yourself under different conditions. I do remember some incidents when I was a child and then a few along the way, I'll share a couple and I'll show you what I mean by being a process. When I was very young, I my father was very racist and It was very disturbing to me. I'm not even sure why, because I was certainly being conditioned to to have the same views of uh, different races. But my father would punish me trying to break my spirit uh, by putting me in closets, locking the door and leaving me there for many hours. And you would think that would break a child. But even at six years, maybe even five, when he started this, it actually built my will. 
And I kept asking the question, why does he see the world the way he does? I don't understand why I see one thing and he sees another. And every time I try and tell him what I see to help him see it, I get punished. That question became a big deal for me very young. How do people come to see the world differently? We packed, my mother packed up and left about the time I was seven, or I probably still wouldn't be alive because we were escalating. But when I was at, in college at Berkeley, I met uh, a man named Tom, Thomas Kuhn, who was lecturing for a year there. And he wrote a book called The Structure of the Scientific Revolution. And it posed the idea that we have as human beings different paradigms. We see the world differently. And we would sit in a um, place called the Rat Skeller on Telegra uh, Telegraph Avenue after the end of class. And he would ask, where did you get your religion? How did you grow up the way you did? And it suddenly occurred to me that we were there was not a broader truth that was true for everyone. And then I wanted, I was reflecting on my father and could begin to see how we came into different worldviews. That drove me the rest of my life, including educating people to notice how it is that the way they're holding, the way that they think the world works will change what they see and change what they can understand. So I chose to be an educator, which to me is a, a leadership process. It's educating the mind to be more whole, more complete. And I founded a few businesses, sold those because they gave me enough footing and grounding and my children were getting older that I could launch out into the world. And as you said, I worked with institutions. I'm a senior fellow at Babson, but I also have worked with uh, CEOs of major companies like DuPont and smaller ones like Seventh Generation and executives in um, Google. In every case, what I'm doing is working as what I call a resource. And I think it's a form of leadership. But it is not you knowing more or providing the way, but for providing the capacity to think for yourself. And so you become as invisible as possible, like your ego in doing it for you. You aren't calling out the, the directions of the game. You're instead building the capacity of teams and individuals to think in a way they can come to their own answers and be a person who, as you said, can be what they're seeking to be in the world and serve in some greater way. So hopefully, I mean, that's a little different than you stated, but hopefully it's helpful. Oh, it's very helpful. First of all, it's I'm always fascinated when someone like yourself who comes on this show talks about the influences that you experienced as a child in terms of how those influences shaped your decisions as you became a young woman and then an adult. And I agree wholeheartedly about education being a process and also that as educators, our job is not to be the, the, you know, the sage from the stage, right? There's that right. metaphor. It's the guide on the side. It's to give people an opportunity. And I'm sure this is how you've functioned with all the amazing work you've done that you, we ask questions. We perhaps ask contrarian questions. You know, I, I love the fact that you challenge the word leader. It's a really loaded word and everybody has a slightly different idea of what that word means. And some people, you, to your point, have a very difficult time actually owning that word in reference to themselves. And yet that's exactly what they're doing. So one of the things that I read in chapter one, Carol, of your uh, book, The Regenerative Life, Transform Any Organization, Our Society, Your Destiny, this introduction, you tie our theory. And one of the things that you, you wrote that really just touched a nerve for me is this concept of the non-heroic journey. And for listeners of this podcast, 
you know that we I have spoken with many people on this show over the years about Joseph Campbell and the hero, the hero's journey, the hero with a thousand faces, and you know all that, all that, the Arthurian legends, you know, fill in the blank here. And yet, you come along and say the non-heroic journey is an antidote to heroic psychology. Heroism is sometimes necessary in emergencies, but it is always counterproductive in making enduring change. The Chinese mm-hmm. philosopher Lao Tzu wrote, water is fluid, soft, and yielding, but water will wear away rock, which is rigid and cannot yield. As a rule, whatever is fluid, soft, and yielding will overcome whatever is rigid and hard. This is another paradox. What is soft is strong. Could you talk a little bit about the non-heroic journey in relation to what is happening in the world today? And we are we are going through massive change from a technological standpoint, point, from a climate standpoint, from a generational standpoint. How is this concept of the non-heroic journey central to the work you do in helping people become better? who they are. That's one of my favorite topics. I need to tell you about another person who influenced me deeply to know where this idea came from. And then I think it'll make a lot of sense. Um, My maternal grandfather was a counterpoint to my father who had said, lock me in closets. And my uh, maternal grandfather was half Mohawk or some, he didn't have blood quantum uh, but his father did and grandfather and so forth. But he, he had lived until he was uh, a little after 10 years old in eastern Oklahoma on a native reservation. And he had moved off and married my grandmother, uh, gave birth to my mother and a couple of the kids. And I got to be in a world with him for about eight uh, or a little more years in learning a very different way. And he was probably the reason I didn't go crazy with my father. My mother became mentally ill. Mm. Um, and what he talked about continuously was the way to be the silent warrior. And that meant instead of always asking what you want to fight against, which I was a fighter and boy, I, I still have to pay attention to it. Um, <laughs> but uh, he would say, what you really want to do is ask what's worth fighting for, mm. not how do I go fight? And he said, and it's really not your job to answer the question. It's your job to keep raising the question. So he was my first, what I call resource, uh, R-E hyphen S-O-R-U-C-E, which means returning people to themselves as a source. So I I came up with that idea I found some other teachers along the way who had a similar philosophy. And then I began to frame this because I had always thought when I was really young and what my grandfather was working on is not me being the hero, which in some ways got all the credit, took all the blame, uh, stood up and fought, which is what we have that I think leads us into war and combat and even the problems we have now where in our political party, we want to be the hero of the party. And it's rare that we have politicians who think about, my job is to return the capacity of people to think for themselves and find their own inner work to do and give up the idea of heroes, which always stand out and are not inclusive or not embedded in work that's being done. So... How that works in my life, what does that look like? It means I don't get recognized in the press all the time. (laughs) My first book, uh, I had a bunch of people come to me and say, boy, are you a great journalist for interviewing all these people? I said, no, I lived all this. I was in it. I was educating all the people I'm writing stories about. I said, well, why don't you say that? I said, because it's not my company. This was Colgate, South Africa, particularly. And the shift that came was learning to be a particular kind of educator. And you you talked about questions and contrarian ones, but that's one small surface piece. 
what I introduce to people is a whole different way to understand how their mind works, how their emotions work. It has nothing to do with emotional intelligence, which is a fragmented, separated idea. It is understanding how whole beings work, whole companies, uh, whole life sheds, and coming to use living system thinking. And I do that by introducing premises. So my one premise I introduced in South Africa, which made us be able to have no violence in the company whatsoever. We were the only company, I say we, I was an outsider, but they embraced me and I got to be a we with them. But every other company was losing money during the middle 90s when Mandela was coming off of Robben Island and becoming president. When he mandated that, well, he and the constitution mandated you had to move from having the top of the company be 95% white or more, which was a population, to a reverse of that. The company had to reflect in, in leadership, your word, right? A makeup that reflected the population. Instead of us ripping and tearing and creating the eight tribes we had being at war, we instead created a whole new model based on this premise. It is diversity, the ultimate diversity, it's the essence of each person. The ultimate inclusion is each person's personal agency. Now, mm. you usually can't do that in a company because you try and make sure everything is fair and equal, and therefore, you create some overarching problem you lay on people. Instead, we created a place where everyone could be a hero if you want to but in those terms, which was they each came up with a promise beyond ableness to be able to contribute something, not only to the company, but to the country. So we had a guy named Isaac Michiel. He was one of 3,000 people who did what I'm going to tell you. He came up with something he knew was really needed in the townships of Soweto and Alexandria particularly, and that was oral health. Now, that, that is also part of the company. But he got dentists involved. He got uh, women who were uh, wanting to have their own businesses. He helped develop all of that so that we reversed the uh, oral health decline in the villages, as well as we reversed, uh, because everybody was working on a project like that. It was very easy to prove what it meant to move to the top of the company without having a PhD or a master's or even a degree in business, you proved you could lead. Now, that's a very different image of how everyone and 100% of people could be involved and therefore the ultimate diversity was every individual essence creating its work and the ultimate inclusion was every one of them use their own agency to produce a premise or excuse me, a promise to some entity like the or Isaac did. We had others who did it with packaging and getting rid of the plastic in the system. And this was long before we were talking about plastic. This was in 1996. So you can redesign work, which is what I do. And you educate people with give them a different premise. And part of that premise was there's no such thing as race. And we brought people in from the universities. Who said, you know, you're right. We've created artificial ideas about what it is. And you really can't do biological testing and define someone's race. But we have so made a mess of how we try and categorize and fragment people. And usually the colonists were doing that work there. It's very hard to actually see each human being and not put them in a category. So I work a lot with crazy premises like that. And I don't tell them this is the answer. I'd say the premise, that means you're standing on it for the moment. You're going to examine it. And we would talk about it. I talk about how we redesign work. Once you've done that, all the ideas softened. They were usually used. And we did frameworks as a way to think better, not models, but building mental capacity and set aims and a lot of personal development. And all of that I learned, well, not all, but most of it 
I learned from my grandfather mm. about how he worked with me. And then I worked with some folks who'd worked in Procter and Gamble and used a similar view. And by the way, my sport is basketball. Okay. And <laughs> I worked a lot with Phil Jackson's ideas, who was the winningest coach in NBA history, 11 championships yes. across two teams, right? And I write about him in my most recent book from all his interviews and writings in his own book about why we can't conduct sports the way we do anymore or we're fostering a kind of destructive process. So I should pause for a moment, see if I'm on point with where you're trying to go. It's halftime here at the Play Your Position podcast, and we've got ourselves a great game. While you're up grabbing another snack and topping off your favorite beverage, make sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss another play. PYP is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever great podcasts can be found. Now, let's get back to the game. Well, first of all, I'm not trying to go anywhere specific. I'm always so fascinated where conversations end up. And yeah, you certainly have touched on several big ideas that are relevant to today still. The whole conversation around inclusion, diversity and inclusion and equity. That's a big corporate across you see it on on the social channel, certainly on LinkedIn, a lot of DEI conversations. And then hearing you, you know, bringing in Phil Jackson into the conversation, you know, people would absolutely label him as one of the greatest leaders in athletics. And yet he was a Zen practitioner. He was the last person who would walk into a room and say, I, you know, look at me, I know it all. I'm the leader. He, what made him so great from my vantage point is he allowed his players to be who they were, that one of the most poignant scenes in the um, the Michael Jackson, not, not Michael Jackson, excuse me, uh, Michael Jordan right. documentary about the, the Bulls, the 90s Bulls, was a, a scene where, you know, Dennis Rodman, he plays his position. <laughs> he is his own person. And that was to some people uncomfortable and they weren't really sure how does this guy fit in here? And Phil Jackson just let him be who he was. And he always held his players to the same level of expectation. He didn't play favorites. He didn't just because Jordan was the best. It couldn't have been Jordan without Scottie Pippen. And in all fairness, the Bulls couldn't have been the Bulls without Dennis Robin. I mean, that that's what you're getting at is this synthesis of of people. Be yourself, and together we move forward. And I, I just think that's, I think your work is, is so relevant and you've been doing it for so long. And you've seen, I mean, when I was reading about you marching against the Vietnam War and being part of the Berkeley scene, you know, in the 60s and how those of us who either weren't born yet or were just mere in infants, we don't know what that was like to be a young person or a young adult witnessing these radical changes. And here we are today going through our own form of radical changes and your work still stands stands tall and, and um, I think provides incredible insight into fundamentally how to tie it to my show how we can all play our positions more effectively in the roles that we choose for ourselves, whether it's within our families, within our businesses, or if we work for a company. So uh, my next question, Carol, to take this one step further has to do with, if you could tell us a story about a time when you felt like you were playing out of position, things did not go according to how you thought they might, you were metaphorically sacked or intercepted, to use my football metaphor. I'm not sure what the equivalent would be in basketball. It may be a turnover, right? You were driving to the basket and then someone came and took the ball away. What happened and what did you learn from that experience? 
Well, first, I have to significantly disagree with your description of how Phil Jackson worked. If you read his books, he got every player to give up the idea of being a star and being who they were in the, their previous incarnation. He did a lot of exercises with them, with young black men in communities to help them understand how they worked as a team together, uh, but almost not being able most of the time to tell who did anything. And he called it their triple offense. It was actually created by a guy named Tex Winter in Texas. I've forgotten where he was. And he said, the most important thing, our work is who we're playing for, are not the owners, not even the people who pay for tickets, but for the um, young black men who have no idea how it is they can be a part of something without constantly being punished for it. Because they're trained and brought up to stand out, to do something that will be known even if they go to prison for it. Because they see us as basketball players doing that. They change the whole thing about how you talk to journalists afterwards. So that none of those players you just mentioned or Shaquille O'Neal or any of those at um, uh, L.A. Lakers thought of themselves as a star. They thought of themselves as one of the offense where things, you change your role, you move roles. You weren't locked in to a particular position anymore. You moved and he would do, and by the way, a lot, most of his work didn't come from Buddhism, but from Lakota elders who lived in the boarding house where he, his, his parents owned. And so he would take them into the locker room and have them learn to breathe together as one being until they could feel they were no longer separate. And he helped work on actively developing, not allowing them to be, but instead helping them learn what it meant to develop and see yourself differently, to see yourself as providing um, a way to be in the world that didn't mean you had to be the star and rich and so forth. And he writes about that over and over, and he said, that was one of the hardest things when he retired. He went out to try and teach people what they did, and they made him back into a star and made his players. So first, hmm. I have to say he had a very different view uh, than that documentary that came out. Um, well, that's so, just it. I can only go by what I saw, and none of right. what you just described made it into the documentary. I was thinking of one particular he was talking to his team about Dennis Rodman being different than right, right, and not in a star way, just being built differently than the the they hadn't seen someone like him before. And True. I think what was not put into the film clearly is all this other stuff you just described. So I appreciate right. you enlightening me because I didn't know that. Well, you will love his books if you appreciate that story, because he's kind of given up speaking. Now, Steve uh, Kerr, who is heading the, um, what are they, the Sacramento um, Golden State Warriors who are winning, he was a, also a player on that same team. Yes. And you can find work he's doing. All right, so your question. I don't know that I have ever in my entire life been in, I've never had a job. I've never had a boss. Uh, even when I had one, I never had a boss. I had small jobs. I mostly have owned my own companies. And what I do is I ask the question every time, I, and I can't not do it. I ask, what can people not see? And that came from being in that closet, right? And then my grandfather and then Thomas Kuhn and a series of other teachers. So I don't even believe in the whole idea of failure, I'm writing a Medium article right now on where you feel like you got undercut or something and saying that's a way of me viewing us as machines, mm -hmm. uh, that we work in the same way something gets in our way and we have to remove it. Wow. I would say in my <laughs> life, I know. So I can't give you a time where I felt like I wasn't being contrarian. My essence is a disrupt certainty. <laughs> um, uh, and I have done it since I was six years old. Yeah. Uh, because I believe that the biggest problem we have that gets us in trouble is our attachment to a worldview. And then we see everything through that worldview and our identification with the way of being so we can't 
let ourselves be fluid and and we say this is who I am. I'm different rather than saying what's my essence. Is that just mm. my personality which is messing with things? So I love disrupting people, not because it's pretty good fun to do because most people don't like it and they are trying to scurry and figure out where to go. But all the people <laughs> who are members of my communities join because they want to live a, a clearer, open, unattached, unidentified life. And they know without the disruption. And that, that I also got this phrase from Phil Jackson, if you don't have disruption, you don't have growth. True. And so I think I'm... I can't directly answer your question. I get asked all the time, tell us about a failure or tell us about a, a place you got fired. And I don't have any of those, but I have almost every day of my life. I have some CEO or one of my change agent members who are coming to me to ask me something, knowing that they're not going to get the answer they asked for. And mm. I love that way of living my life. Well, I appreciate that you challenge people, including me, with your the essence of who you are, because that's what makes life interesting. I I, I find your whole concept of, uh, and I, I'm definitely going to want to read that article. How it, it's so interesting how failure has become so ingrained in the cultural conversation, in at least America, and um, even my my metaphor that I use for this show, which is grounded in you know, American football, is in us versus them. There are obstacles to overcome. There's the defensive line. I mean, all that language is yeah. really not a part of what how you see things. And that's why conversations like this are so important because I'm relatively, compared to where you are in your life and, and your journey, I'm I'm... I'm still growing and learning and I wake up every day. And one of the central questions I ask myself is who do I need to become yeah. today in order to address the challenges that I'm facing? Because who I was, it, it can't solve that problem. And that's what part of the paradox of growth is there's that sense of wanting to feel like I've arrived. I don't have to do it anymore. That's absolutely if, have you ever seen a tree doesn't stop growing in, unless it's dead? <laughs> right. You know, and I've spent a lot of time among trees out in nature. I, it's one of, it's my favorite place to be. And when I get up close to trees and I really look at them and I think, especially the big ones that have been alive for 150, 200 years, when you look at their trunks and, on, and see how they've curved and bent, and you know that has to do with that year, how the light was. And we humans yeah. are the same. You know, our growth is, but what you're getting at, which I love so much, is we need to learn how to think about ourselves in those ways versus the, again, the cultural paradigms that you say, those are just programs that we, be, yeah. that become unconscious. Could you? Explain to listeners the difference, as you understand it, between a mental model and a framework. Yeah, mental models are patterns that are formed that we adhere to, or usually we're taught or we borrowed, but they have all the answers in them. They're full of, you do this related to that, and you've got a pattern following uh, outcome from them. Frameworks are pattern generating. They have no answers, but they have places for, for questions. So if you say the Israelis and the Palestinians are opposite religions and at war with each other, you and you're going to have a, a war anytime you get those together, you've got a mental model. You're actually giving people an image. And if you say, Life has activating, restraining, and reconciling processes. You can ask, what is activating in the Middle East? And it won't be from one side or the other. It won't be from one place. You can ask, what's restraining or needs to be restrained? And you're forming questions. And then you can say, what would be reconciling between the 
the combination, instead of seeing it as a two-term system, one side and the other, now your mind has to work. It has to work to figure out in a situation, what are the three terms that are there with the reconciling, including both, rather than the two terms you're given in the model of why people go to war. So I try and avoid giving people answers. Uh, I, even my ego gets in the way and I think I'm smart. And sometimes I throw out a great answer. And then <laughs> someone usually will remind me, what framework did you get that from? I'll say, ah, very good question. And back I go. So I encourage people to only use mental models or any kind of model the, to build airplanes or bake a cake that you need to do over and over. And it will work in the physical world. But mental uh, frameworks are more about learning how to see the world in a living, fluid way, like you talked about with going out to a tree. If you can see how it grew, you're in a very different place. So that's, um, and by the way, my I would love to tell you why we end up with the uh, two term, the him, the, they and us and so forth comes from the uh, theory of behaviorism, which uh, came in about a hundred years ago and said, people can't think for themselves. They have to have experts to do it and create a, a form of science where only something been validated by a quote expert got to count. You were no longer allowed to think for yourself and schools were changed. Well, we didn't even have public schools until then. They created public schools with experts. And even the teachers weren't considered experts. They had to be given the cur curriculum uh, and uh, yes. everything. Right, right. So what we've done is created layers. We've created a <laughs> class system of experts. And everybody now, you go look on LinkedIn. And I, I once in a while find my PR team change and put back in the word expert or thought leader. I say, get that out of there. I'm not one of those. I don't want to be one. But... We have conditioned our schools, our children, our promotions, everything based on the individual essence doesn't matter. Some people yeah. are smarter than others. They get to decide. They get to grade us. They get to decide whether we get promoted. And I'm about undoing all that behaviorism. And book number seven, which will be out in 2023, is called No More Gold Stars. Oh, get rid of everything. Yeah. <laughs> So Please, no more. <laughs> you know, I I don't I didn't share this with you. And uh, Team PYP knows my in my former life before I, and I still consider myself an educator. But I worked in public education, and I also worked in private education at the college level. And boy, did I fight against the curriculum! In fact, I I'm grateful that I was teaching when I did. I taught in the 90s and this was pre-internet. And I actually had a, quite a bit of latitude as long as I could show that I was meeting the district requirements, you know, yeah. wink, wink, nod, nod. I had some latitude to bring in my own, what, my, what I knew an individual class needed based on the essence of that community. And it was so joyous and I loved it dearly. And my father was a high school physics teacher, his entire career. And he, he was, you and he would have just absolutely enjoyed each other because he is a free thinker and uh, definitely a contrarian mm -hmm. and stood up against the regimented expert class that you describe. And in the state of New York, we have something called the Regents. It, it's a Regents diploma and it's a way of tracking kids. And if you don't grab from a New York state, uh, a New York State high school with a Regents diploma, you're basically labeled as nothing. Right. It's it's an absolute abomination. And you know, because this is the work, part of the work you do, the whole system of, of education is being disrupted as we speak. And yet people are clinging to the old way because that's what's familiar. And it's right. scary. It's scary to think that Maybe you you know we can give our young people a little bit more room to explore and take these tools that we created and do something with them that helps move us all forward. How 
radical does that sound? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's- you know what? I'd love to give you a, a little exercise. I do not so often anymore, but it's so relevant to your concept for your show, which is I walk in and say, think about the metaphor you use for your business. Does it come from football, basketball, soccer, or ultimate frisbee? And mm. what would it mean from each of those? And they get to explore where does the control, the locus of control in each of them. Like in Phil Jackson's version, the locus of control is in the team on the field moving it on the court. Basketball, it's on the side calling the plays. Ultimate Frisbee, there's no one calling anything anywhere. And soccer, it's constantly moving and you have nobody calling plays. What does that do? If you're in Europe where they don't have American football, mm-hmm. I work in companies and they their metaphor changes how they view the world and how all the things, they don't have a behavioral model uh, where something has to come from the outside. You might have fun with that. That's a great exercise. I I thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And and listeners, you know, I encourage you to use that same exercise for whatever it is you're doing. I mean, you could apply that to a family. The yes. unit, you can apply it to, if you're within an organization, maybe you're part of a department. If you have your own business, if you're the CEO or or a solopreneur, very interesting way. And I'm a huge baseball fan, so I would throw baseball in there too, sure. because that's a, a very different game as well. Well, Carol, I, we are coming to the end of our hour together. This has been so just um, <laughs> you've rattled me, and I appreciate that. I, my brain is <laughs> is going. Uh, I know it's part of your. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I know you, you know you've mentioned that you've written s- several books, and you've got. Uh, I think you were telling me in the pre chat you have a summit coming up, and I'd love for you to talk about your latest book and this summit that's forthcoming and who it's for. You know who might consider learning more about it. Yeah, so let me talk about the summit first. I annually do a program which people who are not members of my community, which you have to be uh, to get access to all our materials and way of working. Uh, we pick a subject which is very controversial and I think being handled very badly because it's with programmed ideas. Like last year, as I said, we did racism. And we worked a lot with why was South Africa so profoundly acceptable? So much so Mandela gave us an award for it. This year, we're working on democracy. And why are companies structured in the way they're undermining democracy right now? And what you have to do to make it a social responsibility, the same way you do is uh, diversity and inclusion, as ecosystem, health, fair trade. The one thing that it takes to do all of those being changed is to change how people program their own mind. And we're right now, undermining democracy with all the behavioral rewards, recognition, feedback, which teach people not to think for themselves, but to please others and get their reward. So if you have Mm. a business team of three or four or five people, you come and work together. It's a workshop and it's not a course. So you can't come and take notes in some way and get anything. You come go to work here and break out for six hours on November 15th. And there's a web page, and it's not open to individuals or OD consultants. You have to have business where you're making or producing a, a product or service. The other, um, oh, the website is the Regenerative Business Summit. Uh, and you can get to it off of carolsanfordinstitute.com or you can get to my books, all six of them, off of carolsanford.com. And the most recent one is called Indirect Work. And the whole story is told through Phil Jackson's way of coaching and a couple of companies that have done this, including the American Sustainable Business Council and some more of South Africa. Indirect Work uh, is the name of the book, and it was a number one bestseller on Amazon from March 22nd till the end of April, which is a long time for a book to be a number one bestseller for, from a not big name. So Especially on you. Amazon where, you know, people are constantly... Uh, right. It's, it's, 
you know, constantly cycling through. So team, the links to learn more about Carol's Summit, to find her books, certainly will be available on her show notes page over at pypodcast.com. And to learn more about her, read more about her phenomenal story. I just want to point out as, as we wrap things up here that one of her books is called No More Feedback. Now, this is near and dear. We don't have time to go into it, but I'm just planting that seed, listeners. You know, we, we live in this world where everything has been niche down, niche down, niche down, where I feel like if you're trying to operate on the internet, it, it, it's so restrictive. And yet it's also at the same time, in, incredibly open. <laughs> That's the paradox of the internet. Is, um, it's, hard, it's hard to show up with our full essence online. It really, really is. Is it possible? Absolutely. Because Carol, you're proving it. You're doing it. However, I, I know a lot of people struggle with how do I express myself the full essence of who I am when I have to please an algorithm, when I have to use a keyword, when I have to have SEO, you know, all these things that in, in some ways are, are handcuffing us to being very narrow-minded or very narrowly presenting ourselves. And I know that's for another conversation, but um, mm-hmm. boy, the work you're doing, Carol, is is phenomenal. And I, like I said at the beginning of the show, I it was such an honor to speak to someone like yourself, to speak to you and hear about the way you are disrupting thinking, the way you are inciting all of us to ask challenging questions, not just of our world, but of ourselves. And I can't wait. I can't wait to read your books. Um, I certainly, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. it's quite a list, but um, I'm, I'm really taken by particularly the regenerative life. That's where I'm going to start. And I'm going to encourage uh, Team PYP, get, get any of her books, get all of them, get one of them. But this woman that you heard today really has something special that we can all learn from. So... Carol, I, I want to thank you so much for your time today. And before we say goodbye, what's one book that you haven't written <laughs> that has made a difference in your journey? Well, the kind of books I read, most people don't. I read the history of Pythagoras and Socrates more than uh, any uh, particular one and almost all the more out of print. But there's one called Socratic Method, which I found in a basement in Manchester, England. And if you can find a version of Socratic Method, it'll change what you think that is radically. Okay. Well, I will see if I can find at least a link. I'll put it on your show notes page for for people who are interested in searching something like that down. Um, Again, fabulous conversation, Carol. I wish you the best uh, as you head into the fall and, and with your upcoming summit and with the launch of your, your next book. Thank you, Mary Lou. Hey team, Mary Lou here. Who's number one in football changes from year to year. Fashion trends come and go, same with musical tastes, but leadership skills, they never go out of style. In fact, these days, leadership is an essential survival skill for a world that demands more from us than ever before. To succeed these days, you need to know how to show up for yourself so that you can then do the work you love with people you like the way you want. The Play Your Position Leadership Playbook helps you do this, and it's free. Go to pypodcast.com to download your copy today. If being more successful this year, next year in the 21st century is on your to-do list, get your copy of the Play Your Position Leadership Playbook now pypodcast.com. It's at the top of the page. You can't miss it. That's pypodcast.com and start being more of the leader you are meant to be today. This podcast was produced by Daniel Romeros. Show notes for this episode can be found over at pypodcast.com. I'm Mary Lou Kayser. Thanks for listening. Here at the Play Your Position podcast, we believe that the road to self-mastery and a life well-lived starts with answering the call to leadership. That's when the fun really begins. 
Send this episode to any friends who might need to hear the inspiration and ideas you heard today. And feel free to rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform. 